there is a more significant story in classic Doctor Who, I am hard pressed to think what it would be. Welcome to the Time Treadmill. I'm Ron, and these are my sweaty thoughts about Doctor Who. Of course, the ending of the 10th planet with the first regeneration is massive, and it's what allowed the show to continue on for as long as it has. And then again, at the end of the second Doctor Reign, the first appearance of the Time Lord in naming his planet of origin, Gallifrey, is equally significant. But we learned very little about the Time Lords in that story. This story, however, The Deadly Assassin, sets the tone and the visual style for literally every Gallifreyan story going forward. A couple of minor things about this story. This is the very first story to have the Doctor without a companion, and it's basically never happened again. There have been other stories where he gets a one-off companion for the length of the story, and you could even point to a story like Midnight, where the Doctor is off on his own little adventure for the entire story, but his companion shows up at the end of the story. And the same thing with Heaven Sent, where it is 100% the Doctor by himself, except that Clara shows up on screen at least once. No, this right here is the only story where the Doctor operates for the entirety of the story with no companion whatsoever. No pseudo companion, nothing. It's just the Doctor on his own. And that's partially because Tom Baker insisted that once Sarah Jane Smith left, that he could carry on the series by himself without a companion. And so this was written with that in mind, and frankly, the producers just didn't like how it worked. Not that there was anything wrong with the story itself, but that dynamic of the Doctor having a traveling companion is just so integral to the DNA of the show that it's impossible to get away from. This, by the way, is also the first story in Doctor Who history to have absolutely no human characters whatsoever at any point during the story. And it's worth noting that with Sarah Jane Smith's departure, the Doctor will not have another human traveling companion for several years. He's going to go through traveling with Leela and then the two Romanas before he finally circles back and picks up a human companion in the person of Keegan Javanka. But those are minor things. Those are like statistical trivialities. The things about this story that make it so significant are its painting of the entire Gallifreyan culture. This is the first appearance of Gallifreyans in their high-collared ceremonial robes, a look that has persisted ever since for going on 40 years now. Similarly, this is the story that defines the entire Gallifreyan culture with the president and the chancellors and the different academies, the Pridonian Academy and the others that I can't be bothered to remember because I never cared about them. Speaking of which, back when I was, oh, I must have been 13, 14 years old, I did create my own local Doctor Who fan club called the Pridonian Academy. And I think there were three or four of us in it. It never went anywhere, but that's my one kind of Doctor Who claim to fame. And it's the only reason I remember the Pridonians, which is, by the way, the academy that the Doctor graduated from. But anyway, as I was saying, the look and feel of Gallifrey is defined in this story, including the use of the Seal of Rassilon, the image that was previously used in Revenge of the Cybermen, and then subsequently used by the production designer in this story as Rassilon's seal, and used as such ever since. And I love that symbol so much, I actually once had a tattoo design that matched up that symbol with an octopus. And that, I have a custom t-shirt of it, I have my computer, which is named Rassilon, by the way, has that design on it. I keep saying I'm going to get it as a tattoo, and I've yet to work up the nerve. Maybe, maybe I'll get around to that when the pandemic is over. In any case, this story introduces Rassilon as a character, the founder of the Time Lords significant historical figure. The story also introduces The Matrix, the virtual reality repository of all deceased Time Lord memories, which featured very heavily in the series 13 finale, by the way. And most significantly, this is the story that introduced the limitation of 12 regenerations for a Time Lord. In this story, the Master is at the end of his final regeneration. It's stated plainly that Time Lords only get 12 regenerations, 13 bodies, before they die permanently. Although, as the show has subsequently shown, that 
can be circumvented, of course. But the interesting thing about this is it was introduced in this story as a way to add some drama for the master and to drive the plot of the story, with the notion that with the Doctor only on his fourth generation, it was something that the show would never, ever have to actually deal with in terms of the lead character, because there's no way the show could possibly run along enough for that to be a problem. Ah! So as I say, The Deadly Assassin is arguably the most pivotal story in the history of Doctor Who, and well worth the watch. Even if you've seen nothing else, I would highly recommend you picking up this one off of BritBox or whatever and watching it. It's enjoyable on its own merits without knowing any of the history of the show, but especially given its significance in the canon of Doctor Who, this one is absolutely unmissable. So. Now I just have to figure out what I'm going to talk about tomorrow for the second half of the story. Tune in and find out. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>